Welcome to On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer. Welcome, everyone, to On Top of PR. Uh, we're excited to have you here. We've got a special guest, Dolly Penland, today. Dolly, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me live and uh, in person. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, Dolly is not only a good friend of mine and a good friend of my uh, PR agency, Axia Public Relations, but she is also an important asset to our agency. Uh, she helps us do personality assessments for any uh, finalists that we are interviewing, uh, any team members on our team, and has been a huge help to me and my agency over, uh, well, candidly, for the uh, 18 plus years we've been in business, but more specifically for the last 10 is we've been working together on uh, personality uh, tests, personality analytics. And uh, so Dolly, why don't you give us just the, the quick intro about who you are and what you do, and we'll dive right into the show. Excellent. So thank you for having me. Um, Dolly Penland, my company is Business Results. And basically what I do is I help organizations create a human capital strategy that's aligned with their business strategy. So to your point, helping not just sourcing people, but post hire, how do I better manage folks? How do I um, help keep them motivated and on their game? I always, well, you and I know, we, we both have kids that are about the same age. And when we first met, I was like, you know, are your kids exactly the same? You know, no, nobody says that they are right. But we expect other people's kids, perfect strangers to come into my organization and do what I told them to do because I told them to do it and it yeah. never works. So we want to make sure that we value each of our work kids uh, right. for who they are. <laughs> okay. Well, and and so the first thing I think is on everyone's mind, uh, you know, we like to keep the show evergreen, but uh, everybody has uh, right now the COVID-19 experience going on where they're working from home and their employees are working from home. They're having to manage re employees, not only remote employees, but be uh, remotely managing them in addition to them working remotely. And, uh, you know, you have helped me with this, you know, probably since 2014, where we became very uh, loose and liberal about have, encouraging employees to work from home, uh, having staff that work from satellite offices. And so I always have leaned on you to kind of say, OK, help me look at this candidate and figure out, are they someone who can work at home? And when they are working at home, can they thrive? Or are they someone who needs that social interaction that working from the office brings? And then correct me if I'm wrong, I was talking to a friend of mine about this recently, but also there's a whole nother level of that person may need a lot of socialization, but some of them have that in their social network outside of work. And then some people are looking for that exclusively inside of work. And so we've run into some challenges where there's people who are relatively extroverted or maybe they just don't have a lot of friends. And so when they work remotely, that creates a barrier to them because the social interaction they have are very dependent upon their coworkers versus a group of friends. So tell me, first of all, what are some signs that um, you know employers can be looking for when they're managing their staff about their work from home crew? And then we'll get into more about how we can actually use uh, true data to figure that out. Oh, excellent. So signs looking for uh, performance metrics. So one of the things, I mean, you're good at this because you've been working with your remote folks for a long time, but a lot of people, they were thrust into this pandemic craziness right. and they lacked the understanding of how to create that clarity mm -hmm. that they would have in person where you can have an informal walk by to somebody's office, those kinds of things. So first of all, making sure that we have very good clarity on expectations. What are we, uh, how are we uh, reporting our work back together? What do we expect to be done? When do we expect it to be done by, you know, being even um, not micromanaging, but just making sure that we are uh, clearly focused on our um, ex expectations, our work expectations, and that we're then measuring what those results are that we're, you know, we're, did we get the project at, you know, Wednesday at, you know, one? Uh, did we uh, focus our energies on the outcomes of whatever it was, you know, so we're making sure that we're looking for those kinds of clues first. And then um, if we're not hitting our deadlines, if we uh, see people, if we're doing a Zoom meeting, for example, and somebody just doesn't want to go on camera, uh, you know, it's like, well, is it because they're really introverted and they're um, uh, shy and are they embarrassed? Are they just are they just having like COVID, you know, stress right. um, versus trying to take over the conversation? So let's say you're having a Zoom meeting and they're used to being in control. 
and they're a talker and they like to socialize and you're trying to talk about business and they keep interrupting and going, hey, was that somebody's puppy in the background or, oh, who's got the, you know, it's like, you know, those focus energies. It's not that they're trying to disrupt the meeting. What you're witnessing then is one of those signs that they just need five minutes just to, just to have the real personal connection that to your point, they're missing or would have had in the office. Another thing that um, I'm encouraging my managers and my leaders to do is to be self-aware of their impact on people, even remotely, because we are still in a working environment, a working relationship. Mm -hmm. So if, if I am, for example, uh, very direct and telling, and I know that I have to put the brakes on myself, but I'm under stress myself because of COVID, right. or um, I'm not taking into account, you know, the other, uh, my neighbors, or maybe I'm trying to take care of my, you know, family while I am okay, but still trying to work. Well, that's having an impact now on me. So I'm not doing a self check and therefore I will affect again, the performance of my team. So just understanding what the performance metrics are, what do we expect to be happening? What do we expect those outcomes? And then just looking right. for those signs, are they uncomfortable? Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's very interesting. So uh, the, one of the ways that we work together is like I mentioned earlier, you know, we uh, identify some candidates that we think are finalists. We put them uh, in front of your uh, screener for lack of a better word. And uh, they go online, uh, do a very quick uh, assessment, which I'm always surprised how quick that works. And, uh, and then from there, uh, you know, you come back to us with the with the personality uh, assessment. We always share that with the candidate, also kind of as a value add for their participation in our process. Um, you know, very rarely have I had anybody come back and say that doesn't sound like me. What they usually come back and say, there's a few things that make me uncomfortable, but I think uh, you know it's relatively spot on. Uh, there are um, actual, and I don't want to misinterpret or misexpress it, but there are actual indicators that come back from this. Uh, personality assessment that tell you about their energy level, um, you know, about their uh, level of assertiveness, their socialness, uh and their, um, you know, their rule following capability. But there's also a way for you to kind of read into how well will this person work unsupervised? How well will this person work remotely? Um, how does that work? And, and what are you looking for in the report itself? So as you know, you're giving me way too much credit. I teach my clients how to use this so that they can uh, be the experts at their own offices because I don't work in my clients' offices every day. But, um, but thank you, yes, I'll, I'll be the expert here. So clients like you um, uh, grab the data from their, their folks, they look at them. And what they're looking at is dominance, extroversion, patience, and formality. They're also looking at how they learn, think, and process information. Um, I also do competency-based interviewing with my clients to look at other indicators because, um, like to your point, does this person even want to work at a home at loan? I'll tell you um, right now what, what, I, what, I, what the data I'm seeing is, is that a lot of folks who um, are particularly socially oriented, they need social interactions, are having a harder time uh, right. with remote working not because they don't appreciate getting the work done. So for example, I work out of, uh, I'm a remote worker. My, you know, my company is at home, obviously, um, like, like all of them, but I'm very mission focused. So I get things done because I need to help my clients. I want to do this, but uh, the social interaction piece. Yeah, I, I absolutely miss that. But I also want to socialize when I want to socialize. <laughs> right. uh, where um, I've got a, uh, a client who we have uh, done a lot of talking lately because this individual is not getting the social interaction that they would normally get at, at their office, their shared space, that kind of thing. Right. And I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to be there, that sounding board for them, because I also understand that's their need. So mm -hmm. uh, people who are particularly assertive um, can work uh, strongly on their own in, if, if they have a mission, if they feel like they're uh, still making an impact on whatever their work outcomes are, where somebody who is uh, not as uh, assertive or, or dominant uh, we'll work at home because the rules say, or the company needs me to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, where you're going to kind of focus your energies is on that extroversion piece. Because if I have somebody who's particularly socially uh, uh, needing social interaction, I'm going to make sure I schedule more calls with them, give check-ins, right. uh, do more Zoom meetings or Google Hangouts or whatever people are doing, so that I can, so that they can see me. So that we're actually having uh, a scheduled time. And then with those folks too, one of the things I'm encouraging my clients to do is to do an informal coffee or an informal lunch. 
So you're at your house, you're having your coffee, I'm at my house and we're not gonna talk about business or we're gonna take 30 minutes just to kind of do the water cooler chat that we normally would have done right. at the office. You know, what? hey, did you watch that movie? Uh, you know, what's the latest thing that you saw on Netflix or, you know, whatever right. service, yeah. Hulu. Um, because they just, they just need that debrief. It doesn't have to be work, 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 work all the time. Uh, for my uh, more introverted folks who are just more task focused, they need social interaction too. You know, uh, ask them, hey, do you want to just uh, join in on a on a call for fun? And sometimes they'll say, yeah, they're, 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 they just need to listen. So you just have to understand there's so at 7.5859 billion people on the planet, there's going to be 7.58 or 59 iterations of these behavioral and cognitive uh, abilities that we measure with uh, the so the the human capital assessments that we use. Uh, plus, there's also their uh, their social norms that they grew up with and their their values and their interests. So you have to just understand how people are going to um, be unique and value them for those unique qualities. Um, another thing that we're doing, and I know you and I've had this conversation, is how people follow rules. Because if I'm having to do retraining on what the work looks like. So let's say that they're working remotely, or let's say that I've had a reduction in demand, therefore I'm having a reduction in force, even if temporarily. Well, I might have one person doing the work of two people. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna look at my objective job models uh, and map somebody to this. And I just did this uh, with several clients where we've taken their uh, job models pre-COVID, the, the expectations, the requirements, the um, objective measures of what we need for somebody to be successful in a role. And we're actually mapping people to two roles so that we can um, look at that, how, where the gaps are on the two roles and how to best manage them to their highest performance. Um, and then on training, we're looking at what are those new training protocols. So um, one of my clients has um, uh, individuals who, everybody has different learning abilities. Some people learn things really quickly. Some people take time. Uh, both behavioral and cognitive data sets go into that, of course. And what we're looking at is then what is my investment of time to train somebody to get them up to speed because right. I don't want to lose them. There was a reason I brought them into my organization. And now if I've had to um, give them extra responsibilities or extra work or uh, for some one of my clients, they had some older uh, folks in the workforce who had never done Zoom at all. And right. so there was a whole learning you know, curve around, yeah. no, no, here's how you plug it in and <laughs> here's how you share your screen. Yeah, sure. And you yeah. know, so, and it, it wasn't because they weren't getting it. It's just, they, it never was part of their job before. So there was training involved. So we have to understand that just because somebody uh, has a degree or a certification doesn't mean that they, we don't still need to invest time and energy into developing them, training them, getting up, up to speed on whatever their uh, new workload is. Yeah. So uh, you're making me think of a real life example, whereas, you know, um, there's an employee at our company. She's been with us for a long time, probably eight or nine years now. Uh, and just somebody who works really hard, gets a lot of work done on a daily basis and, you know, is always, uh, you know, agreeable to take on more responsibility. If you want something done, you ask her to do it. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget that you helped me understand, by the way, uh, her employment with our company probably uh, right just barely predates uh, when when you start providing your services to our company. And so I made it a habit on a regular to recognize her in staff meetings, uh, you know, and in, in, in group gatherings for her hard work. And um, and then you told me uh, just kind of giving me an overview of all of our staff when we mm -hmm. talked specifically about her. I remember you specifically said, oh, with this employee, you definitely never want to recognize her in public uh, because, you know, that'll be embarrassing to her or she won't be glad that you did that. And, and you'll be well intentioned by doing it, but she, it'll make her uncomfortable. And I literally gasped because I was like, are you serious? Because I make a point at least once a week to recognize her in a group setting. And um, and so then I quickly shifted my, uh, you know, management or, uh, you know, uh, my style around being with her uh, to do it one on one and uh, and, and you know, kind of uh, I don't want to say in private, but yeah, in private, basically, uh, either catching her in the hallway where it's just one on one or popping in her office and, and, and recognizing her. And, uh, you know, that was eye opening to me as kind of one of the first anecdotal takeaways from, you know, this this engagement in this project or, you know, uh, with you. 
I love that story. And, you know, that's so funny because uh, months later, she actually asked me something like, did you did you say something to him? Because she goes, I he's he's really he notices that I do good work and he's really taken the time to share it with me. And I was like, I was like, what? No, it's just part of the overall <laughs> training, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, how we praise people, how we coach them, how we give them feedback is all unique. I mean, it's I mean, again, I go back to the anecdotes with our kids. You know, some of the kids want the trophy and to be the loud one and goes, look at me, look at me. You know, and other kids are the ones that are like. I got this A. Can we can we have a private talk about how good this was, or can I share with you? You know, I mean, so it's we love our kids equally, right? But they're all right. unique. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just uh, you know, I may or may not have a daughter who can process multiple stimulus at one time. You know, whereas I'm like more one on one. This is all I can do, and you know, I might be able to work with some background music, right? And that's it. You know, whereas like when she's doing her schoolwork, she's got. Uh, you know, a video playing, she's got music playing, she's, uh, you know, chatting and texting her friends, and she's still doing her math or whatever she's supposed to be doing. And I'm just like, you're, there's no way you can really be doing this right now. But she has the ability to do that. You know, and so I might be in a situation where I'm on a conference call, and I'm taking notes, and maybe doing something else, maybe at the same time. And then she comes in and starts talking to me, you know, whatever. And I'm like, hey, I can do one thing well, maybe two <laughs> things. I'm trying to do three right now and you're this fourth thing. And she's like, I don't understand why you can't do all of it at once. So it's just, you know, I'm just not able to do that. So I've had to learn through both people I work with, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of, of, of women in the public relations industry and I've, you know, and there's allegedly, right, there's a stereotype that women are better at multitasking than men are. And so, you know, when I'm working, somebody might ask me a question or I might be, you know, reading something or, or, or writing something and they're still maintaining a conversation while I'm trying to. And I'm like, hey, I, I can't, you know, like I cannot, <laughs> I cannot listen and do the work I need to single task. And uh, but there's other people absolutely at my agency who they will be talking to you and talking out loud about what they're doing while they're doing it. And they're fine with that. And I just, I just can't, I'm, I'm out, you know? So how do we identify those people um, and, and, and adjust our communication style to them? So actually that's a, a couple of things. That's a great point. And, and by the way, uh, just for your audience, I don't know, none of the stuff that I do reveals any of the protected classes. So like, I know you said that there's a stereotype and I, I've actually heard that before. That's not something that we would um, uh, validate science or uh, we can't, can't even, yeah. yes, that's just, that is, yeah, sure. it's not on the science at all. Um, but there's uh, behavioral, cognitive, and then competency-based um, uh, ways that people accommodate those things. So mm -hmm. for example, as somebody who is particularly driving and uh, task focused may be more mission focused. Like I got to think about this before I move on to the next thing, right? Yeah. Uh, somebody who's going to be more demanding or a perfectionist, uh, which you might be a little demanding too there, Jason, <laughs> similarly <laughs> would be focused, <laughs> um, be, uh, but for a different reason, uh, really mm -hmm. what's the quality, 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 right? Um, yeah. Where somebody who is um, very calm, which I am not, might be singularly focused just because they want to take the time, go through, you know, and it's not that they're rushing, they're not a perfectionist, they just are very uh, steady and methodical and systematic about how they tackle their work. So right. there's different reasons why, um, and, and then of course the flip of all of those. Um, and then competencies is, would be uh, learned behavior. So things that people have learned to do to, um, uh, take in all of those different stimuli. So uh, kids, for example, are a great example because they grew up with in, uh, instant gratification, uh, technology at their fingertips, you know, holding mm -hmm. their first iPhone or iPad or whatever, you know, when they're two years old. Yeah. So yeah. their learning style from those technologies has, has had an impact, but I've seen adults do it where the, you know, I've seen, I, I am more, you know, I, I like if I'm working on something that I, I genuinely need to get done, I don't want any stimuli. Like I want to work on the one thing. Right. But if I'm doing something that's boring or I hate, like my, you know, my corporate compliance or, you know, running payroll or any, what I call my high D days, my high detail days, you right. know, 
I, I will definitely have music going on in the background or three tabs open because I'm reading three different news articles while I'm doing it because I hate it. So therefore I'm procrastinating, yeah. but I've got all the other stimuli going on. Um, so people will do those for different things. Now the competencies then we would actually like interview around. Um, so if I need uh, a quiet work environment where I have a lot of cubicles or, or you know, for example, back in the day when we actually used to go to an office um, and we can't have a lot of uh, stimuli and other noises. We might actually uh, interview around that. Tell me how you uh, uh, like to work. What is your best, uh, you know, work atmosphere, those kinds of things. So there's different right. ways to drive at those kinds of things. Um, I will tell you anecdotally. So again, not science, uh, younger generations. I, I have seen some of those folks do it, but again, it goes to their unique behaviors and their neat, unique learning styles. So um, I've got two daughters. One of them wants her head canceling uh, headset, her, her head, yeah, noise phones, I don't have them here. Yeah. yeah. With no music on and she's my go, go, go kid. Right. But she yeah. puts those on when she's doing any kind of school studying, reading or anything yeah, like that's that. Me. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. She doesn't want to hear anything where yeah. the, um, the other kid is more like your daughter, you know, all yeah. over the place. So yeah. again, we just want to value them as what's the out, but see, then here we go. Why, why would we want to control that? So we, as managers, when we're working with different uh, employees who have these different uh, work styles, we want to make sure that they have an environment where they can uh, have what th those needs met, right? So right. Uh, yeah. we can actually ask them, how can we create an environment for you to be more productive? But what we're then measuring is what is the outcome? What is the work I'm doing? Because ultimately that's what we're looking for. Did I get the uh, right campaign? Did the did we produce X number of widgets, you know, within X number of time? You know, it's like, so those mm -hmm. performance metrics, so the one thing, and I know uh, you're familiar with this, but your audience, they, they're not, I, I really focus on, you know, what is our strategy? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? What differentiates us from in the, uh, our comp competition in the marketplace? Right. And then what are the measurable results that we're looking for? Hence my company name, business results. Um, you know, what are the results that we're looking for? Because we should be able to um, have ongoing pulse checks for success. Success is not a one-time event, right? It's ongoing. What are our metrics? Um, you know, not just our, our tenure goals, but what are we doing this week to get us toward our metrics of success? If we're accomplishing our metrics very quickly, then are we being too conservative? You know, so we, and that's we should have those kinds of metrics uh, established for our employees. Our employees right. should know what their individual contributions are, what their expectations are. I do not like uh, personally. I am not a fan of uh, annual performance reviews because I don't think that somebody should wait 12 months to find out that they were doing a poor job. I like right. ongoing <laughs> conversations with good metrics for success where people really understand how they're being, uh, uh, what, their, what their performance metrics are, so how they're being judged for their performance. But then also so that they understand their, the value of their contribution. I like to make sure that they understand how their little piece is helping the, uh, the ultimate organization's uh, big outcomes. Uh, right. That's empowering for people to know those kinds of things. Yeah. If there's workflow or team issues, so if I've got multiple people working on a project, they all need to be in agreement on you know, what the project is, why we're doing it, uh, but then the measurables, the deliverables that are unique for the different team members. So uh, I always use the example of a football team. You know. My quarterback has a different job than one of my linemen, right? right. Uh, but they're wearing the same jersey and their yeah. goal is the same. So we have to yeah. make sure that they're, um, we're coordinating their efforts uh, into a successful strategy. You're listening to On Top of PR with your host, Jason Mudd. Jason is a trusted advisor to some of America's most admired and fastest growing brands. He is the managing partner at Axia Public Relations, a PR agency that guides news, social, and web strategies for national companies. And now, back to the show. We are not a perfect organization by far, but somehow we managed to go 63 months at our agency without any turnover. And a big part of that is what you're describing is we looked at the person and said, you know, uh, my wife and I just finished watching, uh, binge watching uh, The Good Place, right? And so, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you haven't seen the show, I'm not going to spoil it for you. And I'm going to actually give you a poor description of it. But that is that, you know, it's like these people go to the afterlife and, you know, in some way it's designed to be exactly what they, you know, wanted. It, it accommodates, you know, what their ideal situation is. And so similarly, we look at it and we say, we want to hire the best PR 
people we can find. And then we want to surround them with the tools and environment to help them succeed. And we want to, to embrace that there are things that they do well that they want to do. There's things they don't do well that they don't want to do. So we want to take away the distractions, the inefficiencies and the undesirable work experience. Delegate that to someone else who loves it. Like you said earlier, you don't like doing the paperwork and compliance. But I guarantee you there's somebody on my team who does, right? And there's somebody on my team who doesn't. So we try to partner them up and separate the work in a way where, you know, there's, believe it or not, there's some people who want to work in PR who are introverts and don't want to pick up the phone. But there are other people who will pick up the phone and talk all day. So we try to divide the work in a way that I can take what you do best and optimize your time and talent to give you more of that and less of what you don't want to do. And so, you know, look, again, we're not perfect, but 63 months without any turnover, a lot of that, you know, there's some credit there. Some of that goes obviously to what you've helped us accomplish and what you've helped us do. And one of the big things, you know, is, um, and I mentioned this to you many times is when I got my personality index from you, my, my profile, uh, it was very clear to me it was very validating to me. There were things that I do and, and challenges that I have that I thought were, you know, how do you say, uh, made me, um, you know, uh, uh, deficient in some way, but instead it was affirming that, yes, that's me and I struggle with this. And, you know, now that I know that I can leverage my strength mm -hmm. and, you know, one thing I'll never forget that was very revealing was, you know, um, you said to me that I that I struggle to delegate authority and I pushed back on that and said, no, I love to delegate. And you were like, yes, you love to delegate tasks. You don't quite delegate authority well. And so that was eye opening to me to see where I could, you know, shed and give away, you know, more than what I was giving, you know, so that I could be more efficient and in and, and my time. And so, you know, through a process of, you know, five years or so, I started to really become more astute and, 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 and interested in, in culture and developing my team and things like that, that, you know, this was part of that process of that eye opening uh, or awakening, if you will, to the importance of personalities and managing personalities and, and, you know, putting players, if you will, in the right positions where they'll be happy and successful, not just where the, where the team needs them to be. Um, so, you know, and, and I think that was one of the best things that, you know, has come out of our relationship is helping me look at people as the assets they are. But, you know, um, as our friend Dwight Cooper says, you know, um, you know, what's best for you is what's best for the company. Um, and so I've always tried to look at it that way, too, is kind of, you know, what is the best way? What is the best job experience for them, employment, career experience for them so that we can create employees for life and put them in the place where the good place at Axia, where they'll be the happiest. So. Oh, I love that. And I'm going to uh, just kind of reaffirm what you just said, because you just said four cre uh, key points that I really think that your audience uh, needs to understand. Uh, first of all, you uh, gained self-awareness. Everybody, everybody has Absolutely. their own strengths and everybody uh, seems to think that they're self-aware, but we, but we don't spend time actually self-coaching and understanding what our strengths are and what are what to your point deficits. Although I usually don't look at the deficits, I I really focus on the strengths. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the carrots, not the sticks, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, <too>. But <laughs> less painful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah much. <laughs> um, but really, it starts with self-awareness because I have to understand uh, that I might be the one getting in my own way. Um, I know, for example that I really don't like the details, you know? So it's like, I do uh, have uh, an assistant that I can tap when I need to, to do some, some work for me. I do have uh, my accountant who does my like CFO for hire work, you know? And I, I did all that stuff for years because I know I need to control everything, right? But I yeah. also don't know what I don't know. So I, I finally had to say, okay, what will I let go? How can I let it go? How, how do I, because I want my business, my, my business to be successful. So I like that you said that it was, that it, it was self-awareness and that it took time to develop that self-awareness. Everybody's great. I'm great. You're great. You know, all the people in the audience are great. Uh, we don't understand our impact on others. So starting with that self-awareness piece is critical. And then I like that you said uh, dividing up the work. So having multiple job models. So I have different focuses. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my clients uh, for their project managers, we created um, a client faced project managers who do more of the client interactions and then a uh, task uh, focused project manager who handles more of the, the inventory management and the, the deadlines and the scheduling and the, the, the work with the individuals, the, their uh, uh, frontline workers. 
because they had, they, why not divide up that work, make it more successful. Um, and then we, uh, then you talked about teams, actually, you know, making sure that the environment is um, high performing so that those uh, different contributors can, can work together, they can share, they can collaborate so that your talkers and your uh, task focused people both love PR, they both love the work. And now they can work together to capitalize on each other's strengths at a peer level, because you're not there holding their hands every minute of the day, right? right. <laughs> so that's, right. Not a, that's not a leader's job. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that those teams have been coached or developed, uh, that they have good expectations, that they understand where they're going to go so that they will be successful. And that does reduce turnover, which is amazing. I didn't realize it had been 63 months. So that's awesome. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. And then culture. A lot of people just don't uh, investigate culture. They don't uh, reward. They'll say we have this culture, but then they don't interview around it when they're bringing new candidates in or mm -hmm. they don't reward culture, you know, those kinds of right. things. So right. uh, one of my clients, I recently helped them create culture questions, culture interviewing questions, because they're doing a lot of hiring right now. They actually see this uh, pandemic environment as an opportunity. So mm -hmm. uh, we were creating mm -hmm. culture based questions, um, instead of just saying, uh, you know, these are our cultural values, you know, we're interviewing around them. We're, we're yeah. taking a deep dive to explain not just what our culture is, but to get an example, does this person believe in that culture? Uh, you know, are they wanting to uh, embrace and embody that culture? Because you, we, we go through so much trouble and effort to create our vision, mission, values, to, to make sure that we have the great products and services. Right. So we want right. to make sure that um, that piece doesn't get neglected because uh, when other people interact with those employees, they'll know if that if somebody actually is embracing that, that culture. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like those values. Um, the vendors will know, the, their, their clients will know if they're client facing, you know, any, any of those kinds of things. We want to make sure that, yeah, we're we're recognizing and rewarding cultural wins when people yeah. exemplify uh, yeah. those those values and those cultural expectations and that we interview around it when we're bringing new people in as well. Well, we are quickly running out of time. I think we could talk about this all day long. It's a topic that I love, <laughs> one that's had a lot of impact on me, both uh, personally and professionally. Uh, so credit to you for that. Um, but I will just share with our audience that you know, uh, if you have a, if you're having difficulty managing certain employees, uh, if you're having difficulty getting your best out of certain employees, if you're having difficulty interviewing well, uh, or, you know, uh, figuring out the right alignment of position and, and KPIs and other things. I mean, these are all things that we've received a lot of help from you over the years, um, including, you know, just talking to some of our employees who are, you know, maybe struggling to, uh, articulate and be successful in their role or whatever it might be. And so, you know, you've been a really big help to, to our agency and I know you'll be helpful to our audience, which is why I asked you to be on this session today. So in closing, uh, tell us how our uh, audience can get a hold of you and, um, and, and maybe a resource or two you would recommend. Uh, sure. So they're welcome to go to my website, businessresultsllc.com, uh, business standard spelling results with an S, llc.com. Um, there's a lot of uh, my blog. I keep it up to date with uh, good current information. So I really encourage folks to go there. Um, mm -hmm. They're welcome to email me if they would like. Um, and I think, didn't you and I write an article uh, years ago that uh, I don't know if you, we could share that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. But I would start with my website. There's a lot of good uh, research. Um, one of the things that I like about uh, like the work that you do with your clients is you help them create those you know, amazing uh, campaigns, those PR strategies, really helping uh, to be successful. What then I like to make sure my clients understand is that you have to have then the people in those client companies that, that can execute <laughs> those, those campaigns. Right. You know, it's like uh, that, you know, if, if we're doing a lead generation campaign or awareness, or if we're doing marketing or advertising or something else, uh, mm -hmm. that do you have the right salespeople who can sell? Do you have the right research and development people who are uh, able to create the products to perform? <laughs> you know, do you have the right customer service people who are going to, you know, take care of your folks? So it, it never is just one person or a one-time event. It's a, the, the things that you and I do are a, a holistic uh, uh, approach to creating, again, yeah. that human capital strategy that maps their business strategy. 
And, you know, a lot of our conversation today has been talking about, you know, how to manage the people who report up to you. But I've also been very uh, pleased with using uh, your services to help identify the third party audiences that we're also working with, meaning, you know, um, you know, having uh, our primary point of contact on the client side, complete an assessment so that we can better understand how we can communicate well with them and how we can, you know, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of feedback do they want? Do they want a comprehensive detailed report that they can take and read, or do they want to hear it audibly, or do they want short little sound bites summarizing, you know, our PR program? And so I think for our audience, that's something to think about too, is, you know, um, their supervisor may not be letting off the clues and cues that you need to understand how to best communicate with them uh, because you have very limited interactions with them uh, kind of thing. And so go ahead, Dolly. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that I teach in the customer focused uh, selling training is to identify those cues because, uh, you know, not doing the assessments, off, you know, from the client side, but to, to take that and understand and how you're working with uh, the client uh, is going to be uh, critical. So that's a that's a, a competency that that we teach. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And sometimes it takes a long time to learn how to read somebody and figure out what they really want. So if you can get an accelerated path to figuring out how do I best communicate and appeal to what this person is most interested in, you know, that would be, you know, that's that's a great shortcut that's, you know, can be very valuable. So, all right. Yeah, that's so, sales training. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so ahead, it's uh, businessresultsllc.com. Mm -hmm. Or they and can email are, me. Yeah, dolly at businessresultsllc.com. No. Actually, I just made it results at businessresultsllc.com. That way they go to the main uh, email. So results at businessresultsllc.com. Perfect. Okay. Well, Dolly, thanks for joining us today. We're really glad you were here. Hope you enjoyed uh, our session together. And uh, we also wish that as well for our audience that they found this time to be beneficial and have learned how to create an edge in their leadership and management style, the way they communicate and the way they lead and the way they get the most out of uh, performance out of their, their team. So uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Dolly, and uh, look forward to continuing our conversation soon. Thank you. And I always love talking to you. I, I love to talk. You can talk to me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much. This has been On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer.